Good evening and welcome back to the second programme in the second series on Coppers and Brass. In this programme we're going to be looking at the issue of identity in Irish traditional music, traditional music, whose music. And I'm delighted to say that we have in the studio a man who probably would bring a lot of understanding to that and that's Danny Diamond. Danny, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me, Tommy. Not at all, Danny. We'll be coming back to Danny in a second uh, to explore this very fascinating topic. But in the meantime, let's have a look at the views of some other people on the subject. Music is music, and music was always there, and um, it was maybe used by certain elements as a banner, as a badge to show who they were. But the music they were using was music that belonged to everybody. And there's songs like uh, The Bright Orange Heroes of Cumber. As we walked up and down on the road, they poured it down. Our drums, we did rattle like the thunder. And as the day drew near, filled each Fenian heart with fear, for we're the bright orange heroes of Cumber. Come out, you black and tans, come out and fight me like a man. Show your wife how you won medals down in Flanders. Show them how the IRA made you run like hell away from the green and grassy lanes of Kilishandra. Same tune, different sentiment. The most iconic and famous of all orange tunes, the sash. A few bars that are instantly recognisable by the vast majority of people, you know, and, and its origins lay in music hall. Um, the, the, the hat my father wore, a, an old music hall song. And before that, the original air is regarded as being an ancient air sure. Marching bands became into being in Ireland because the British military were marching in Ireland and people that were watching them or had been in them adopted that tradition. The first, the first use of marching music in Ireland on a wide scale was probably with the Irish volunteers. A result of interest in Ulster Scots culture that people have found a route back in, Protestants have found a route back into traditional music and that things that the, the, there's an open door there. It starts off maybe as a single identity thing, uh, but it's inevitable once you get stuck into the reality of what traditional dance music is um, and the reality of what the song tr tradition and the dance traditions are like, that it's very interwoven and complex Irish, English, Scottish and American tradition and uh, that's all to the good. I think my impression of the way things operate and did operate is in, in my own experience of learning traditional music in Belfast. If you, wanted, if you really wanted to look into the religious background of the people that were doing it, of my, my particular bunch of influences and friends that were, they were, they were Catholic, Protestant, atheist, God knows what. They were just people that were linked by this raw bar of traditional music. They didn't really, I think, Maybe, I think people maybe subconsciously did avoid potentially sort of conflictual conversations about politics. They were Protestants, they were Catholics, they were whatever, were whatever they were, but they were musicians and that's what they did. It wasn't an issue with them. The only thing, problem was that sometimes people from outside the musicianal, musicians community perceived them as being one thing or another and the music began to be perceived as belonging to one side of the community, so the other side shouldn't get involved in it, and those that were involved in it should pull out of it. 50 years ago, what would be regarded as a Cayley band would be the main entertainment in halls, in this hall and in halls like this, all through, throughout Ulster and indeed beyond further down into the island. But as I said, it wasn't perceived to be being right that you could play this music which was being played almost in the name of something that was trying to destroy you or to overpower your own identity. What happened with regard to the agreement and the outworking of the agreement was that um, the pie began to be recarved up in a way which um, uh, really uh, was at odds with the history of the tradition. And so while the peace process um, secured peace, 
there, there, there was there was instituted as a result kind of a war of ideas about who um, should play what music and who owned what type of music. Irish traditional music really falls into line with what was happening to anything that was taking the label Irish. You know, Protestants in Ulster, Protestants in Northern Ireland, well, they perceived themselves to be under attack by a movement, um, a terrorist campaign, by people who were fighting in the name of Ireland, by people who were calling themselves Irish. And unionism just could not equate calling itself Irish whilst also adopting movements that claimed to be Irish. So there was a pulling away from Irish music, Irish identity, Irish culture. Once it becomes divested of any sort of trappings of you know, political messages, you know, which, it, which essentially it is anyway, it's not really, you don't, you're not expressing your political opinion by playing a reel, you know. But I think since the peace process has come in, I think people have begun to see that it, be, it does belong to everybody and everybody has access to it as they always had before, but now people are beginning to see that the music always was there and always belonged to everybody and only certain elements were taking an angle on it. I hope that that's over. Well, Danny, a wide range of views there. Absolutely, yeah, and interesting you, stuff. Yeah, we could, we could be here all even discussing them all. But um, before we do get into them, Danny, maybe you tell us a little bit about your own background because I think that's very relevant to the subject. Well, I probably cover a few areas there that, that we, you mm -hmm. know, other people did in those clips. My, my parents, both from the north, one Catholic and one Protestant. Um, my grandfather, Leslie Bingham, um, my mum's dad, started playing the flute in the early 60s from, mm -hmm. a, from a probably pretty conventional Protestant mm -hmm. background, northern Protestant background. Um, Tara, my, my mother, then met Dermy, my dad, who plays the fiddle and is from West Belfast, from Antietam. Mm -hmm. So they, they really came from two opposite sides mm -hmm. in a conventional mm -hmm. sense, and the music brought them together. And then mm -hmm. they ended up moving to Dublin at the height of the Troubles, largely to, to get away from that kind of what they saw as a toxic environment, as opposed to be the raising the family, and, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And so I was only a, a young child when I moved, and my sister, who's also a musician and singer, was born in Dublin. But mm -hmm. we'd still have a kind of, uh, very northern influenced perspective, you know, with all mm -hmm. that background in mm -hmm. the north. And you, you, where are you working now? But myself, um, I work in the Irish Traditional Music Archive. Mm -hmm. I make field recordings and organise our collections of other people's field recordings mm -hmm. that are given to us in Dublin. And I also work a bit as a musician playing with a band called Morga and a duo called Danny and Aki and a little bit on my own, under my own. And good bands they are too. Well, um, thank you. Um, as the the theme of this subject arose from a conference which I was involved uh, with, which I was involved in 1989 or 1990, I think, uh, in in the Killahevlin Hotel in Enniskillen, and the theme was traditional music, whose music. And at that time, um, we were a long way from a peace process. Um, we were at the height of the troubles and divisions, but the communities probably couldn't have been any further apart than they were. Uh, then, and there were a lot of people you know, came to the conference with different views, and it was a very tense moment in debating uh, uh, the origins of Irish traditional music and the perception that it seemed to be played by one community uh, rather than another. We thought we'd revisit it now many years later, over 30 years later, there's been a peace process. Um, I know you weren't around at the time, <laughs> but you, knowing what you know of the time historically, do you think there's a, a, a change in attitude? Uh, would you be aware that the Protestant community is more involved or less involved or the same in what we know as Irish traditional music? It's an interesting question and, you know, probably hard to give you a direct mm. answer, you know. <laughs> but, uh, or a short answer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Most of the people that I would have grown up with, friends of my parents or people who were around me growing up, who were from a Protestant background mm -hmm. in the north, um, there were quite a few of them and they're still the people that I see most often who are from that background who play traditional music, Irish traditional mm -hmm. music. I don't see a whole influx of young Protestant players. Mm -hmm. And it does, it is something I, I notice. And maybe though me living in Dublin, 
I'm a little disconnected. Mm. I'm not sure that could well be happening underground in the north. Mm. But mm -hmm. that's my my uh, feeling for it, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the peace process has caused there to be more funding available. There's more high profile mm -hmm. events. There's better venues. There's all this infrastructure around mm -hmm. the music. But yet, I'm not sure how it breaks through the barrier mm -hmm. Uh, if it does any better than it did 30 years previously. Mm -hmm. I feel that maybe the the folk revival of the 60s and the kind of opening out of folk music and then Irish traditional music by extension drew in a lot of people from all types of backgrounds, including Leslie, my granda that I mm -hmm. mentioned previously, mm -hmm. and, and other family friends who still play away and have you know, lived their lives in the, the music scene. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the subsequent troubles really threw up a big you know, Big division buyer. between mm -hmm. the communities. And I think there's still more work maybe to be done before that division is eroded and, and people can easily mm -hmm. go back to mm. playing whatever music or listen to whatever music they want, free of baggage, you know. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, uh, Quincy Dugan was making the point uh, earlier that, um, which kind of begs an earlier question, the one we're asking is what is traditional music rather than whose music? And uh, he was making the point that Irish traditional music, um, the Cayley band music uh, came after the marching band tradition and the marching band tradition came out of the army garrisons and, and many of the, the Cayley bands, the, the founding members had been part of marching bands that had been influenced by the British. So there's a whole context in which he's saying that his marching tradition is as much Irish as ours. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to take a little break on that one, but in the meantime, I want to take another one of our weekly trips across the river to the cobblestones and this time we're joined by Vinton Valley and Vinton is a man who has also written and spoken extensively on this issue but this time he's going to reflect some thoughts on it uh, through music and we're going to listen to a very appropriate march that tells a tale. I'll do one more, it's the um, <clears throat> it's a tune which has jumped ship many times which I taught to all of you. Um, <laughs> uh, it's called the, the Shanghai March which is Echoes and all sorts of other tunes, um, jigs, reels.
Well, that was Vinton um, in his inimitable style, playing a tune and using the tune to demonstrate that the one melody line kind of two different uh, community contexts, for want of a better word. Um, there's probably no finer um, dissertation on this whole issue of identity in Irish traditional music than Vinton's book, Tuned Out. So those who want to learn and go into this in greater detail, I highly recommend that book. Anyway, Danny, mm -hmm. um, before the break, we, we were talking about the point that Quincy Dugan raised, which was around the issue of, of uh, not about identity in music, but, but the actual music itself, what is Irish traditional music. And essentially, he was making the point that the marching band tradition that he's part of in Northern Ireland actually predates, say, the Cayley music movement or the session music, uh, mm -hmm. movement music, for want of a better word. Um, and he's saying that, that that tradition came out of the the army garrisons all around the island of Ireland and the local people picking up uh, musical instruments and tunes and marching tunes. A lot of the tunes that came across, uh, polkas and jigs and that, weren't intrinsically Irish. They came in predominantly, but not exclusively, by the British army. And therefore, they have maintained a tradition that we have sort of erred or lost. And any views on that one? It's a very interesting point, and it's another of these quite open-ended issues I think like um, there's definitely something in it and I've heard Finton himself speak similarly before Finton Valley who you mentioned there mm. about the evolution of Irish traditional flute playing mm. the the role that marching bands played in that flute bands um, they were not only garrison based of mm. course and they were endemic across the whole of the island in the late 1800s you know and um, the wooden flute that we play today is, can be seen by many people as a kind of a, a legacy from from that <laughs> era, you know, from that music. But I'd say that the repertoire, it definitely, I'd say definitely marching band music in the north could well predate, say, session music, mm -hmm. which is really a product of, you know, what, the 1950s on, yeah. really, mm -hmm. Irish people going to London and, and all that, mm -hmm. uh, different different outlet evolving for, for their music. But um, look, be even Further back in time than, than the origin of the, the marching music, you've got Celtic harp music, you've got mm -hmm. Turlock O'Carlin, you've got Shanno songs uh, from the 1700s and, and poetry and that that connects into. There's there's another tradition underlying there. That tradition, the, the, the bardic tradition, mm -hmm. feeds into the traditional dance music we play today in a, mm -hmm. in a different form. You know, some of the jigs might be the air of... Um, a Shanno song that's mm -hmm. a poem from the 1700s by Owen Rowe or Sulo or one of these guys. Mm -hmm. um, the marching band music also feeds into it, mm -hmm. as does Scottish music. Neil Gow tunes being played by fiddle players in Dublin in a session now. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's just a big mixture of loads mm -hmm. of different influences. So it's not really, in my opinion, a case of the music one person's being older or more authentic maybe or, or mm -hmm. that they own the real thing or the other person also feels that it everyone owns mm -hmm. a big mixture of everyone else's music and that's that's it you know so uh, are you saying that there's a broader context than, than the purely uh, divide between Catholics and Protestants to traditional music there's a broader global issue around identity well once I think once anyone claims kind of possession or, or rights mm -hmm. on, on a tradition, and these traditions are very organic and they don't really allow for easy definition. And once you, if someone can claim some type of ownership on, on the music, but once you delve into it in any detail, the picture always gets a lot more complicated. Mm -hmm. And usually the questions get unanswerable, you know. <laughs> um, so, and it's only, yeah, it's complicated as you, in your question there, um, even further complicated these days with information mm -hmm. revolution in the in mm -hmm. the world in general and availability of music, mm -hmm. call it, uh, you know, of, of Irish traditional music on a global basis. You get people from anywhere and everywhere hooking into it, all mm -hmm. different identities of theirs being brought to bear on it, different mm -hmm. ways of playing, different um, preferences, musical preferences and all that feeding into it, getting more commercialized as well. Mm -hmm dictating back to the people playing mm -hmm. it how to evolve mm -hmm. their music so many different different things going on um in a way if you look at it in that scale it puts an interesting perspective on the, the issues in the north of ireland actually danny a lot of the issues you've raised like the broader context we are picking up 
in forthcoming episode on boundaries of Irish traditional music, uh, which is part of the same question, whose music and what music. Mm -hmm. So that there are many, many overlapping things. But in, in conclusion, um, do you, do you, even though those wider contexts are, are ones which need to be addressed and researched and debated, um, do you live in hope that more people from the unionist community might get involved in traditional music as the peace process deepens and hopefully the situation, community relations issues improve? Absolutely, yeah. And I've seen, you know, great initiative. This is just one, one example of where you can find hope, you know. Mm -hmm. um, this book handed down by Nigel Bullier. Have yes. You seen I've, it yourself? Yes, it great, deals great with book. The, mm -hmm. the music in Earth. County Down, mm -hmm. where, where my half of my family roots are, you know, and I've seen up there that the the local tradition, and I would I'd be hesitant to call it Irish, for for yeah. fear of, of mm -hmm. offending people's sensibilities, but it's traditional music, fiddle based mostly tradition, great music, great tunes, but it, with the polarization of everything in the um, 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. 80s, the the older musicians were dying away, people were afraid. It was so laden mm -hmm. with with uh, identity and meaning that people coming up were afraid to get to play it, to carry mm -hmm. it on, and it's really in danger of dying out. So even if if young people could feel comfortable with getting into that, that aspect, type of tradition yeah. that, that mm -hmm. they can really see as their own, but mm -hmm. the more they get into it, maybe it would draw them into the into the broader mm -hmm. um, tradition that that all feeds into, and they they could meet fiddle players who play Irish mm -hmm. music, and maybe the two of them could find they have tunes in common and. That's evolve cool. away from there, mm -hmm. you know, that, that would be fantastic to see. Yeah, that's a good hopeful message they, they end up on. It's a great book and it's a great chapter of that whole issue that I think everybody should have a look at. Um, Danny, I want to thank you for coming in and help us with what is a very, very complex issue in a very short period of time. <laughs> and I want to thank you and your family who have given so much to traditional music or whatever way you want to describe it on this island for at least a couple of generations, three generations now. Three and and hopefully and more. Yeah. <laughs> but thanks very much, Danny. Thanks for having I really me, appreciate it. It's great to have you along. And that was Danny, and uh, I think you'll agree it's a fascinating subject to which we can't do credit to in the short period allotted here, but nonetheless, one well worth keeping an eye on. Next week, we're going um, to explore an issue arising from this conversation, Danny, which is the impact of immigration on Irish traditional music. And we're delighted to have Peter Woods along to help us with that. He brings some very personal informative views on that. In the meantime, keep playing, keep whistling. Take care. Salaam.